there's a guy named John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby, he was Irish, correct? Irish? He was, um, he was British, uh, but he was born in Ireland, and he okay. was an Anglican priest in Ireland. Uh, so Darby starts ministering in the UK around 1830 or so? That's right. Um, and uh, you say he developed three new interlocking ideas. What were those three big ideas uh, that, that Darby came up with? He's a premillennialist, and, and that's a major part of his theology, but that's not actually the original thing that he was interested in. He was actually interested in trying to separate out uh, church authority and state authority. So it's, it's a core issue that Americans deal with as well. But he basically decided that there are two... Um, radically different realms. There is the church world, which is heavenly focused and should be focused on saving souls. And then there is the worldly focus and that that is something that the church should never get into, should never touch. And so this, uh, out of this came a certain reading of the Bible where the entire Bible for him was divided into passages that applied to the church and passages that applied to what he called Israel, but that's God's worldly work is with the nation of Israel. So Darby developed a way of reading the Bible where suddenly, because of these assumptions you're bringing to the text, you start seeing different things in them. Um, and that developed a, a reading that, that uh, comes to this term dispensationalism, where there are multiple stages in history um, where God's working with either the church or with Israel. And, um, and right now we're in the church age, according to Darby, um, which means God's working with the church. Uh, but the church has a very distinct role, which is to call people out of the world and to get ready for heaven. And uh, God will resume his work with Israel uh, when he raptures the church, pulls them out of the earth, and then he'll just do what the Old Testament prophets uh, said um, uh, God would do, which is work with the nation of Israel to establish the millennial kingdom. Uh, so Darby develops this uh, way of reading, and this develops a certain way of thinking about the church, which is very distinct, um, which uh, becomes sort of this ecclesiology. Um, and then that develops an eschatology, a way of seeing what's happening in the future that is uh, really focused on the, the Jewish people and what they call the regathering of the Jewish people in their old uh, homeland um, and anticipating the rapture, uh, getting the church out of the picture so that God can resume uh, his work with Israel. So that's really where, uh, that, that sort of 1830s, 1840s, where Darby develops all these ideas that eventually become the, the bedrock of dispensational theology. Okay, so uh, three interlocking ideas. There's a, there's a new theology of the church. There's a new theology of the millennium. Uh, what's the, is distinct, that the church doesn't have a role in it, that we're, we're out of there, and it's the Jews who run the millennium? Yes, uh, that's a big part of it. Also a very particular sequence that has, you know, a rapture and then the rise of an antichrist and then a great tribulation, um, a battle at Armageddon, uh, Tel Megiddo in, in Israel. Um, these different parts of these are in longer church history, but what Darby does is assemble them in a certain sequence that become, you know, pretty popular among dispensationalists later on. Pretty, pretty popular, you'd say? Pretty popular. Uh, uh, you, even you, in a multi-million dollar or multi-million copy uh, fictional yeah, series is based pretty, on it. Yeah. Pretty popular. You're given to understatement. Um, new theology of the church, new theology of the millennium, and then a, a new dualism between heaven and earth. Right. Um, and it's all, it is all kind of interlocking where, okay, if you're in the church, if you're a Christian, you're heavenly minded, not earthly minded. And the focus really is on getting people to heaven. So he brought the ideas to the U.S. What's interesting is kind of the historical moment that he arrived in the U.S. So why was it so significant that he arrived in the 1860s and 1870s? What was going on? And, and, and this is fascinating, and I, I had not thought about this at all, that made... Um, his message so compelling to pastors in particular states, you right. point out. Unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so his first trip is in 1863, so in the depths of the Civil War, first time he visits the United States. And so uh, he, he makes a few trips, uh, ends up being very popular 
uh, in the border state region. So states that were uh, in between the north and south, uh, they, they, they picked a side, but the, the populations were deeply divided. So, for example, in Missouri, um, the, the pastor I follow, his name is James Brooks. Um, he was in uh, St. Louis, and he actually lost his first pastorate during the Civil War because he refused to pray for Union soldiers. Um, he he actually was on the northern side, though he was born in the south. Um, but he his congregation was more northern oriented, and when he refused to pray for northern soldiers, he said he doesn't want to pray for either side. Um, uh, interesting way to sort of sit out uh, the the civil war. Mm -hmm. But um, he was kicked out and started a new church that was more neutral uh, to his to his liking. So the border states um, are are these regions of the country that are right in the middle of the war and have really divided populations. And you can just imagine how, as we talked about. Darby's understanding of the church, how this would be particularly appealing to pastors who are looking for a way to not have to pick a side, either because they it's really hard to pick a side and there are consequences of that, or because theologically they don't think the role of the church is to sort of weigh in on, on war. So he walks into the U.S. in the middle of the Civil War, comes back repeatedly uh, right after the Civil War, and is popularized uh, by some very prominent pastors who are trying to avoid the sectarianism of the Civil War, basically. They, they're, they're looking for a theology that says, hey, can't we all just get along and stop focusing on our differences? And where it gets really interesting in the story is where you get to Dwight Moody. And I, because, okay, I, I mean, I grew up, you know, in Chicago around Moody Bible Institute. I dated a Moody girl. My grandmother <laughs> went to Moody. We had Moody Monthly Magazine in my childhood church in Iowa. You know, so I, so I, I hadn't realized what a role Dwight Moody, you know, who is the most popular and successful evangelist of, of the late 19th century, um, I hadn't realized that he had jumped on the premillennial dispensational. And so premillennial dispensationalism is the specific brand of premillennialism uh, that was generated by Darby. Um, and Moody was an early proponent. And this was a time in American history up to this point where many of the leading thinkers were post-millennialists. Right. And it's such a huge, huge change of mind because if you were post-millennialist, particularly at the height of the British Empire, you viewed the whole world as being Christianized and right. you know, heading just in of unavoidably toward the millennium. Heading, it's just, just look at progress. So much progress everywhere. We're headed towards the millennium. This is fantastic, praise God. Um, and then you hit uh, the Civil War in the U.S., and and now you know the same Christians that were marching arm in arm toward the millennium are now killing each other. Um, the churches are splitting and taking sides. Everything is falling apart. Christian unity is in decay. And then you get a guy like Moody who has the reach that no one else has in the in the American church. You know, and that point, who picks up this new theology. Um, and I think you would argue, correct me if I'm wrong, he didn't really embrace the whole thing. He no. kind of, <laughs> no, he, was, he wasn't, because I mean, even even uh, you write that Darby wrote about meeting Moody and said he wasn't very impressed with his grasp of, of the material. Right. <laughs> I don't think Darby, or I, I don't think Moody, um, you know, thought he wasn't a theologian. We'll put it that yeah. way. He, he didn't think yeah. deeply about these things, but yeah. So Moody picks up Darby. He, he, I mean, he, as I, we've mentioned, he, he meets Darby. They don't really hit it off. So it's not like Moody had this great meeting and then said, Ooh, I wonder what that guy's written and, and reads it. What he's really interested in is, um, is, is sort of the same thing that James Brooks was, which was a theology that gets people to move past the Civil War and Reconstruction. And for Moody, the big cause is missions, is revivals and missions. And so what he sees in dispensationalism, or at least what Darby's teaching, is that um, we th this whole vision of the church that is otherworldly um, is a way to move beyond, to, to be really blunt, uh, race, race issues. To, to move beyond these really sticky issues that are happening after the Civil War around Reconstruction, around racial justice in the South. And Moody basically says, can't we all just get along and focus on global missions? And uh, so 
in part, the ecclesiology, the view of the church helps him do that. The other part is the end time, the, the sort of imminent rapture gives a, a sort of urgency to the whole thing mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. need to do this before time runs out. So Moody has a famous quote where he says, basically, I see myself as um, on a sinking ship, which is the world, and mm -hmm. I'm just throwing out a life raft to get anyone on um, that I can. That's a very distinct theology that, as you mentioned, does not really comport with the longer history of American post-millennialism, which is that the American state, manifest destiny, all that kind of stuff is bringing in the kingdom. Moody sort of rejects right. all that and says it's actually about missions and it's about this um, pulling people out of the world, pu putting people on the life rafts uh, to get them out of this world before the rapture. Because what I, what I was putting together, which I'd never, it never occurred to me before, but that new belief of an imminent rapture coming right after the Civil War, um, which led to Moody's entire life focus that we have to globalize, we have to, we have to evangelize the world. We right. have to, you know, it, it's, you know, A.B. Simpson praying over the globe and, and weeping. It's mm -hmm. like, we have to get the, the word out to the entire globe as fast as we can because Jesus could literally come tonight. Um, yeah. And because of that, now you can see where he would look at Reconstruction after Civil War and Northern churches and Southern churches not agreeing to even talk to each other, much less get back together. And there was initially after the Civil War a movement, well, let's put the Baptists back together and let's put the Methodists back together. And, and they were like, no, no way. Right. You know, we're still mad at you guys. We don't see eye to eye at all. But it was, it was Moody saying, oh man, how are we gonna do global missions if we can't get along. And the only way to get along is to set aside all of everything we've been fighting about, which, yeah. and this is where it just kind of smacks you in the head, which means, hello, African-Americans, we're not gonna pay any attention to your plight because you are the source of the, the, uh, the, the breakdown of, of the unity of the American church and we have to do global missions. So we're going to throw you under the bus in the name of global missions. Is that what happened, Daniel? Because I'm feeling pretty bad about that if that's what <laughs> happened. That's definitely part of the story. Um, now, it, it's not, uh, yeah, it, and there are certain, I think Moody basically made that calculation. Um, and I'm, uh, there's, there's a great historian named Ed Bloom who wrote a book about uh, 15 years ago, making this argument, not just about Moody, but about a whole generation of evangelicals, uh, white evangelicals after the Civil War. I do think there are, it's a little more complicated in some other aspects. There are, um, you know, Darby hung out in places like St. Louis. He also hung out in Boston and New York, believe it or not, places that you would never associate now with um, uh, with dispensationalism. But there were movements within the North as well that, that adopted some of Darby's views, and they were much more uh, abolitionist in orientation. And so there were um, uh, there were uh, different leaders in the late 19th, early 20th century who spoke out against Jim Crow, who uh, published Du Bois in, in their magazines, um, okay. who, but, but they would always stop when uh, resistance from white Christians meant that there would be a breakdown in missions in particular. This is a distinction I hadn't really thought about. Are we pushing for racial reconciliation or are we pushing for sectional reconciliation between right. the North and the South? And if we want the church to work together again, we, sectional reconciliation became a higher priority than racial reconciliation. Um, Dixon, right. who took over Moody Church from Moody, was quoted saying uh, that granting suffrage to freed slaves was the blunder of the age. <laughs> Right. So, okay. Now that's not, yeah. that's not saying that, that, that automatically came with Darby's theology, but when Darby's theology was mixed into the mess that was post-Civil War America, yeah, parts of it became easily redeployed to justify focusing on heavenly things. That's right. And not racial reconciliation. So it's kind of astonishing that Darby's, a section of Darby's teaching became heavily propelled throughout America and American Christianity, um, but but just a section, not the whole thing. We didn't get right. the whole thing. We got bits and pieces, the biggest of which and the most influential of which is just the notion of an imminent rapture, that right. any any moment, you know, you could go to bed tonight and wake up in the morning and your wife is gone. Just that, right. that whole idea was really, it started with Darby 
And then Moody made it, you know, spread all over America. Something again that Darby, at this point, you know, if we're talking about the 1880s, 1890s, Darby dies in 1882. Um, he, he would probably wish this whole thing never happened. Um, he is so disgusted with the way the American church uh, takes his ideas. He he wouldn't have really endorsed uh, any of this, uh, but uh, but by this point, um, the U.S. story has taken on a life of its own. And this is one of the things. Often, when the story of dispensationalism is told, it's it's told as if there's a straight line from Darby to Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye in the late 20th century, and that's just not the case. Uh, the, what what Tim LaHaye is is doing in the Left Behind novels. It does have resemblances to Darby, obviously, but it is in such a different context with such a different purpose that uh, that you really do need to do the history just to understand how far things traveled um, over yeah, that. And we span. are going to understand that because in the next episode, we're going to pick up with the end of Moody all the way through Tim LaHaye and Left Behind, and it's going to be fantastic. So, so will you stay around for that, Dan? I would love to. You're yes. not going to abandon me halfway through the history, are, are you? No. So so long as the Lord tarries, I will I'll be here with you, Phil. <laughs> and then Phil turned and Dan was gone. Oh no, <laughs> it happened. Okay, stick with us. We'll be right back. 